kind of an experiment um, for you know this this idea that I've been asking or this question I've been asking about you know using business as a, as a vehicle for doing good. Um, so with that in mind, uh, my friend and our business partner and I created Blue Marble Ice Cream back in 2007. And and people ask me a lot, well, you know, what makes Blue Marble special? What in New York City especially, it's such a competitive landscape for small businesses. How do you stand apart? What do you do to make yourself special and bring customers and attention your way? And uh, I'd say, you know, there's a few things that make it special. Number one, um, it's owned by women. The company is owned by two women. And although women outnumber men in terms of overall population in the United States, uh, there are almost twice as many businesses owned by men than by women. So I'm hoping that your generation will you know, make some progress in evening that out. Uh, and secondly, our product is very special. Um, we use exclusively organic grass-fed dairy, organic sugar, all in organic ingredients. Um, to my knowledge, there is no one, no independent kind of ice cream company really on the East Coast doing that. Um, so that makes us very special. And then lastly, perhaps the most, I don't know, important defining characteristic of who we are and why we're special is basically who we are as a business and what we aim to do with this business. Um, can we go to the next slide? Can anyone guess, I'm giving you a clue here, why we call ourselves Blue Marble Ice Cream? Exactly. That's exactly right. So this photograph is actually very famous. It was taken by one of the crew members of Apollo 17 back in 1972 on their mission to the moon. And he snapped this photograph and he basically likened the, the appearance of Earth to a big blue marble. So now big blue marble is kind of a nickname for planet Earth. And so we thought that was an appropriate name for our ice cream shop. Um, not only because we use exclusively natural and organic ingredients, as I said, there's no artificial coloring or flavoring of any kind, um, but also in all that we do, we try to be as responsible and responsive to, to the earth around us, to the people around us, to the landscapes around us. So we use only biodegradable cups, bowls, spoons, etc. cetera. Um, we, I think, very kind of generous in our response to our employees and to our customers, to our community. Um, and lastly, um, we've kind of extended this, this um, commitment or this idea that we are citizens, really, as business owners, we're citizens of this much larger community and we need to be responsible as such. And in that kind of spirit, um, do you want to go to the next slide? About three years ago now, we founded um, our own nonprofit called Blue Marble Dreams. And the mission of Blue Marble Dreams is to, this is gonna sound funny to you, um, but to use ice cream as a way to support the joy and well-being and prosperity of communities near and far. Go to the next slide. And any discussion of Blue Marble Dreams has to begin with this woman. Her name is Kiki, and she's from Rwanda. She lives there. And she looks like, you know, your normal, pretty lady, um, and she is that, but she's much, much more. Um, I really would describe her as a visionary. She is uh, a writer, um, a performer, a poet, um, an educator, but if you were to ask her what, what do you do, she would say, I'm a dreamer, I'm a, I'm a professional dreamer, that's what I do, that's my job. And she really is, that's a really apt kind of title for her, especially um, given where she lives. Go to the next slide. Rwanda, um, it's kind of hard to find on a map. It's really, really, really small. You see it's not even enough room to actually put the uh, country name in there. But it's a very small country, very populous uh, nation. Um, and we know what happened there not so long ago, right? I don't know how old you guys are. It probably didn't happen too long after you were born, actually. But what happened? Anyone know what happened? It's a very significant historical event in Rwanda. Anyone? Yeah. Exactly. Genocide. In 1994, uh, the country essentially was torn apart um, in a kind of a brutal conflict between two groups. And in about a month and a half, almost a million people were killed. Um, look that up when you go home. It's a kind of a gruesome chapter in, in the history of humanity, but it's important to, to know about and learn from. 
So Kiki, the fact that she's a dreamer in the face of this history, and if you go to Rwanda, 1994 may seem like a long time away from for you guys, but actually it's, it's, it, was not, it was not long ago. And if you go there, you still feel the mourning, you still feel the sadness, you still feel the heaviness of the memory of the loss. It's very much there. And, you know, when we met Kiki, and I'll get into that story in a minute, you know, she was telling us that in war, of course, the infrastructure suffers. You know, your buildings are destroyed, and roads are destroyed, and farms are destroyed. Um, and of course, people are destroyed, lives are lost. But even the survivors are also emerged, they also emerge broken. And you have to rebuild roads and rebuild buildings, but you also have to rebuild people and communities and relationships. And and cultures, you know, when someone dies, they take with them the expertise they had and the traditions that they had and the language and then the and the stories. They take with they take all those things with them when they go. And that's a devastating loss. So Kiki kind of took it upon herself to to address that, to take that kind of head on and to do her small part in, in rebuilding um, not just a community but actually psyches and hearts. Um, you want to go to the next slide? And she did that first through drumming. Uh, Kiki, being the visionary that she is, essentially approached the kind of the cultural authorities um, in her community and asked for permission for uh, the creation of a women drumming group. Before Kiki intervened, women were not allowed to touch a drum. And this is now like six, seven years ago. This is not ancient times. You know, this is quite recent. Women were not allowed to drum, and drumming is a very kind of significant part of, of the traditional culture there. It was a man's domain, forget about it. Women weren't strong enough to even lift a drum, so why would they want to drum? Well, she made an argument of why she thought women should drum, and, and I think just to kind of get her out of their way, fine, 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 do, do what you want. Start your little drumming group. So she posted little signs around town, starting an all-female drumming group, come on Saturday, it's gonna be fun, you know? And I, as the story goes, the community was kind of buzzing, like, what, that's, that's crazy. So on the first day, a handful of women showed up. Again, never had touched a drum, so they knew nothing about it. They'd heard it, of course, they were familiar with the rhythms and the sounds, um, but had never actually drummed themselves. So the first day, a handful, Second time, 25, 30 women showed up. Third time, 50, 60 women showed up. And by the time it really got going, there was well over 100 women coming consistently every week to learn how to drum. They didn't have many drums. I think they had maybe 12 or so. So the women would just wait and, and take their turns learning how to drum. Well, sure enough, they learned. And it went from a handful of women who had never touched a drum to a group of over 100 who tour actually internationally. Um, in Europe and, and the United States primarily. <clears throat> and that's a picture of them there. And you can go to the next shot, another picture. And <clears throat> so as she got these groups going and she just watched the impact it had on the lives and on the kind of the spirits of these women, um, Kiki got even more inspired. You know, she saw them coming together. I mean, I should note that the women who make up this group are from both sides of the conflict. And it's interesting, in Rwanda, um, you know, there are two primary ethnic groups. And everyone knows what they're called, the name of these groups, but you're not allowed to say it anymore. It's illegal to say that name. If you get heard, the wrong, if the wrong person hears you mention one of those words, you essentially can be imprisoned for inciting genocide ideology. So they're very much taking the mindset of, we are one nation, we are one people, we are moving forward together, there's no more differences, we are together. Um, so women that make up this group are from both sides of that, of that conflict and are coming together to create music together, to create experiences together, to create their own kind of community together. So when Kiki saw, like, wow, this, this is just drumming, this creating music, this new camaraderie is really having a really significant impact on these women. Well, if this drumming group is possible, then what else is possible? And um, at that point, point, essentially, she happened to meet my business partner, Jenny, who was actually also a, a, an actor in the, in the arts. So she and Kiki met at a, a theater workshop. And when Kiki learned that Jenny had an ice cream shop, the light bulb went off. She said, this is it. This is the next dream. My community needs an ice cream shop. Of course, right? <laughs> First drums, now ice cream. That's it. We need an ice cream shop. Um, so you go to the next slide. 
<coughs> so she explained her rationale for why she thought this was so you know, needed, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but over the course of about two years of planning and fundraising and trips back and forth between Brooklyn and Butare, which is where Kiki lives, um, we proudly opened the doors, and actually it'll be a year tomorrow, it'll be a year anniversary. Um, we opened in Zuzi and Ziza, which means sweet dreams in mm -hmm. Kenya, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, it's kind of a funny photo, but you see what we serve there is ice cream, coffee, and dreams. So it took us some convincing, <laughs> because when you think of Rwanda and what it could possibly need, ice cream isn't the first thing that comes to mind, <laughs> at least not for us. Um, but Kiki was bound and determined to make this happen, so she really laid out her argument very clearly. Do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, the first was to kind of um, to carry on with the work she was doing with the drumming, to continue to give the women in this group new dimensions to their identity, to themselves, um, to continue to forge these bonds between the members, um, and to really to contribute to their sense of fulfillment and happiness. So these are some of our staff members here, outside of the location of the shop. Um, the next one. The second, of course, was to create jobs, to create sustainable livelihoods for these women. Um, on the tours that they would go on, they would get a little kind of a stipend, um, and that certainly helped. But many of the women have children um, of their own. Many of the women have taken on children of family members or community members who passed away. So there are several, I think almost most of the women have um, taken in kind of orphaned children, so they're responsible for their well-being. Take, you know, taking care of, of parents and grandparents, and they really carry a, quite a heavy load. So by creating this new business with and for them, um, they have jobs, they learn kind of practical skills, um, and they basically kind of support their efforts to, to care for their families and to build really positive, healthy futures for themselves and their families. Um, <clears throat> So we actually partnered with this group of women and we are co-owners in the business. And over time, as their capacity grows and as their confidence builds, we will pass more and more of the ownership on to them. Um, and to hopefully within the next two or three years, we'll be completely just standing on the sidelines. The business will be all theirs to kind of, you know, ride off into the sunset with. And we'll be on the sidelines kind of cheering them on. Um, so that was the second piece. You the next one? The third was, this is something that was very kind of compelling to us, because this is what we try to do here in New York City. And she told us that um, Rwanda is actually a land of milk. The huge milk drinkers in Rwanda. You'll see taxi drivers running around town with these pouches of milk. Everyone is drinking milk. It's like the Capri Sun of Rwanda or something. I don't know. Um, and, and so milk is very much a part of their culinary culture then, but they have never had ice cream. Um, you can get it, it imported, you know, in the capital. You can find it. It's expensive. It's well, well um, outside the means of most Rwandans. Um, but the, the kind of the palette was there, so it wasn't some outrageous thing like we're trying to introduce a product that had was had no cultural relevance. Um, so by creating this product, we could support local farmers, local fruit growers, local coffee, you know, co-ops. Um, and, and try to do, as I said, what we do here in New York, which is you know, supporting local agriculture, agriculture and, and um, kind of instilling in the public a real value. You know, it's hard, so much from in Rwanda is imported and it's very expensive, and, but they have so many resources and so many kind of, I don't know, resources in abundance. Um, the idea was to really kind of translate them into something, a kind of a source of pride and a source of, um, of livelihoods and of fun, of course. So, um, and aside from that, aside from the farmers and the fruit growers and the producers of, very, of various kinds that we work with, um, we employ security guards and cleaners and seamstresses and electricians and plumbers and tradespeople of all kinds. So in that sense, we're really kind of buoying the, um, the local economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and the last bit was basically, you know, it's, it's ice cream. <laughs> you know, do we need ice cream to survive? No, we do not. But is it delicious? And does it give us this kind of sweet respite from a hard day? Yes, it does. 
and we all deserve that. And another thing, you know, going back to the, you know, my beginning of my talk here, I was talking about being frustrated with corporations and how they responded or didn't respond. Another thing that never sat well with me was um, the, the concept of human rights or human needs. I mean, of course we all need to survive, and so people need shelter, and they need food, and they need water, and they need health care, and they need all those things, absolutely. But we're human beings. We're not, we're not just robots to, to maintain. We need to laugh. We need to smile. We need to live. We need to relax. We need to indulge. Um, because only when you do those things does your mind kind of open up to what else is possible in life. And as you can imagine, you don't have to travel to Rwanda to guess that life there is really, really hard for most people. Um, you know, when reality is so close and it's kind of so suffocating, it's very hard to push back and create space for yourself to, to ponder, to dream, to think, well, what else is possible for me? Because you're so consumed by surviving and getting through day by day by day. And no human being needs to live or deserves to live like that. We all have to work hard in our various ways um, but to get what, we, get what we want, but we also need to indulge. We need to relax. We need to laugh. We need to have that space to contemplate and, and, and um, develop friendships and, and to enjoy life. And it's interesting, um, as I mentioned, you know, Rwandans, most Rwandans had never had ice cream, at least in the community that we were building a shop in. They would ask them, say, yeah, I saw it in a movie, or I heard about it once, um, but most had never, ever tried it. Who remembers the first time that you had ice cream? I don't remember. Does anyone remember the very first time you had ice cream? No, right? Because it's, it's such a part of our lives here. It's just our, such a part of our kind of culinary cultures, our psyches or whatever. It's just, it's just part of life here. Um, and I'll tell you what, I remember on opening day, Watching people eat ice cream for the first time was quite an experience. Watching people eat something cold for the very first time. You can imagine that sensation? Because it's very odd, it's very unnatural, unless you're an Eskimo or something, but it's a very unnatural thing. And one woman asked me, does it have to be so cold? <laughs> <laughs> it does, I'm sorry, it does. Um, so, you know, Kiki's idea was that by providing just this sweet little treat, you're doing something much more, actually. You're creating a little pocket, a little break, a little, as you call, you're in this set of brackets, you know, you can just rest there comfortably just for a few minutes and indulge and eat this sweet treat and just, just kind of revel in the, 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 the frivolity of it, the whimsy of it, the fun of it. And as I said, you know, as human beings, we all deserve that. Um, go to the next one. This was taken just actually about a month ago. We had a, a kids' day and brought all these kids in for free ice cream. And, and I'm sorry, but like, that's just awesome. <laughs> Never had ice cream before. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying ice cream is going to save any lives, it's going to like transform Rwanda. It's not. But that's not what this is about. It's just about creating little opportunities um, from time to time for people to just to sit back, to relax, to come together, and to, and to live, and to enjoy life. Um, and, and Kiki was particularly interested in, in providing opportunities for children to, ex to witness seeing their parents experience joy. Mm -hmm. As kids, you know, we grow up and we kind of look to our parents to figure out what we can expect out of life, what we, you know, what we get out of life, what's the appropriate way to kind of navigate our way through life. And, um, you know, as I said, life is so hard, and so with, with children that don't often get to see their parents just sitting back and having something kind of fun, they, they don't necessarily get the chance to understand that this is an important part of life and you deserve this and you can create opportunities for yourself to get this. So we wanted to, to really kind of make sure we were mindful of that and to create opportunities for families to come together and to have fun together and um, just to savor some sweetness together. Uh, next one, last, last one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at that. She is staring into her bowl of ice cream. I just, that photo kills me. Um, there's just a lot of possibility in that little bowl, and I think she sees it. 
And who knows what's possible as a result of that? The last one? Um, I don't know how well it comes out on yeah. the screen, but uh, this is taken from the front porch of the shop. This is the view. Ooh, hey, that's nice. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful, beautiful setting, right? Rwanda is incredibly gorgeous, and um, the, you know, it's a nickname, nicknamed the Land of Thousand Hills. I bet it has even more than a thousand hills. But this is a view coming right out of our shop. This is what you see. And this picture is really inspirational to me and is, says a lot. And I'm going to close with this and with, I'm not even going to beg, I'm going to insist that you guys do something. And that is to be, to be outrageous with what you wish for, what you believe possible, and what you work towards. Um, you will, you'll never achieve more by expecting less of yourself, of others, and of life in general. So, you know, you're young, you're, you've got lots of resources at your fingertips, starting with the school and all the, and of your surroundings and your, your family members and your friends. You have so many resources um, at your disposal um, and, and explosive potential is within, is within sight for all of you. So I hope you kind of take a deep breath and, and, and go for it with all you got. And then the last note would be, um, as you kind of venture out into life, I would ask that you just take some of those images with you in your, in your mind or in your heart and remember that life really isn't just about surviving, it's about living. And, um, and part of living is extending, extending yourself to others. And you don't need to be rich, you don't need to have an ice cream business, you don't need to travel you know, near and far um, to change people's lives. Um, there, unfortunately, there's sadness and hardship around every corner, on every block in this big world of ours. And in a, in a myriad ways, you, you yourselves can find ways to, to support the joy and well-being and prosperity of each other so that we all don't just survive, but we actually, you know, breathe a little easier and smile and, and thrive. <laughs>